Hello, everyone, and welcome to VTC 2021. I hope you can all hear me. If you can all hear me and see me okay, please give a thumbs up. Awesome. My name is Dave Curran. I'm a member of the VTC committee and a co-host of this workshop. Saigon South International School is honored to be hosting the ninth annual Vietnam Tech Conference in collaboration with Eunice Hanoi. It's also my honor on behalf of the VTC committee to introduce to you Juliet Marcus and Natoya Voot, who will be talking to us about effective language support during online learning. A bit about our two workshop presenters today. Juliet is a secondary EAL teacher and grade level leader at International School of Ho Chi Minh City. She has taught EAL for over 10 years and holds an MA in Multicultural and Bilingual Education. Latoya is the EAL and MIP English Language Acquisition teacher at ISHMIC. She is an Australian educator with 13 years of secondary teaching experience. And her aim is to empower teachers with skills and resources so they feel confident teaching a greater range of students with diverse learning needs. So without any further ado, Juliet and Latoya, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, it's over to you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, we're gonna go ahead and share our screen. Okay, guys, uh, good morning. Um, today we're gonna be talking about, oh, uh, effective language support during online learning. So our objective in today's lesson is to identify effective strategies for supporting students in an online learning context. Uh, a bit of a note, we initially, uh, the workshop was advertised as an interactive workshop, but we, due to the time limits of the presentation, I had to curtail that a bit. So there will be, for questions at the end, um, but there won't really be that interactive um, element that we sort of had initially thought about. So please keep your questions to the end and yeah, we'll get to them. Okay, so a little bit about our context. So Latoya and I work at ISHMIC, which is the International School of Ho Chi Minh City. We are an IB world school, which means that we um, use the IB continuum. So PYP, MYP, uh, and then DP. We're a secondary school of 700 students. And the way our EIL program is structured here is that we have grade level English language classes. Um, so we have a dedicated EIL teacher for each different grade. Um, and then this year we've enrolled, been able to further develop the program and roll out within the grades where they need them, both emergent and proficient classes. So the emergent um, are for the students that have higher language needs. And those groups also get push and support for certain classes, um, usually science, math, and then individuals and societies. And in addition, we have a higher proficient class, MYP phases four and five. And those are classes that are really uh, focused on literacy skills. So making sure that they uh, yeah, have a strong focus on reading and writing. In terms of uh, online learning, we were on online learning for four months uh, last spring and then two weeks. Uh, this year. So we've been really fortunate here in Vietnam that we haven't been in online learning for, you know, the entire stretch of the past year. Um, so we have just have been in and out of it for a few months. Um, so that is our specific context. And then with online learning, uh, the way that our school addressed online learning, and this was through several iterations of having to kind of change and adapt and really be receptive to what works how does it work? How do we need to change our schedule and expectations? Um, well, during online learning, the timetable was amended to decrease instruction time and increase in agency. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you can see to the right, this is how our schedule looks during online learning. Let's see if I can move this thing. Okay. Um, all right. So the change in the schedule was made to incorporate flexibility into the timetable. Um, teachers were available for one-on-one -on -one meetings before and after school. And so you can see that in the schedule in the red boxes from 7.30 to 8.30 and then three o'clock to four o'clock. So there was dedicated time within the schedule for students and teachers to have what we found to be really necessary, which was time to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with students or groups of students who really needed that extra support. Um, we had mindfulness embedded into the curriculum, which is something that we do regularly too, and that we continued our commitment to during online learning, making sure that we still address well-being through mindfulness. And again, having those lesson times be a little bit shorter than they normally would, because uh, as Latoya will talk to you a little bit later, 
you, one of the things we realized during online learning is that you really have to decrease instruction time uh, and give students more time to really focus on what they need within the lessons um, and within the school day. All right, um, next one. So at ISHMIC, we have tiered levels of support. So in addition to content teachers, we also have advisors. Um, we have an advisory program. So every student is supported with uh, an advisor who they would see every day during online learning and that they see every day when they're here on campus. Uh, in addition, we have grade level leaders. Um, I'm the grade 10 level leader, so I can speak about that a little bit. Um, we kind of overview all of the students, uh, both academic and well-being, um, and just notice any patterns within our groups uh, and help support individual students uh, when needed within that. And in addition, we have assistant principals, both of well-being and academic, and of course, a principal as well. Um, and then within our language learning context, context um, we have subject teachers, so your chemistry, your science teacher, INS, math, etc. And then we also have EAL teachers, uh, of which Latoya and I are both. Um, we have our own language acquisition classes, so those are dedicated classes uh, for language learning. And then in addition, we provide push-in again, for those high need students. And so that's when we go into the classes uh, and help the subject teachers modify their curriculum or just provide support for the students uh, as an extra pair of hands in the classroom. Okay, I'm gonna move over to Latoya. Hi. <laughs> so one of the things that we face is, why is this so hard for the language learners? Um, what challenges do we face with the changing educational landscape? We go from, in class learning to online learning just within a couple of days. So we were told yeah. in the evening, the day before, tomorrow we're going to online <laughs> learning and we just had to be prepared for that. So our adaptability and our flexibility has definitely been challenged. So we polled our students after the last online learning and overall students said their biggest obstacles were a lack of engagement, um, and motivation to be online all day, to be on the screen. Maybe the first few days, it's a bit of a novelty and it's kind of fun, but then slowly they start to show up late or their camera's broken. And so there was that lack of motivation, which you can really see after the first few days and the novelty of it wears off. There was a lack of confidence to ask for help, particularly our EAL students. Um, they didn't want to use their microphone and speak if they weren't confident with their English. They didn't want to write in the chat for everyone to see if they were worried about their grammar. Um, there was a lot of confusion, confusion as to what the tasks were. So when a teacher is explaining verbally without the written instruction, it's really hard for the EAL students to follow online. Even if they put uh, the um, closed caption function on, it's often incorrect. There's all different accents when uh, teachers are speaking, so it is really hard for them to follow. And we also polled the teachers and they said that the rapidly changing circumstances were a big challenge, not having the planning time, uh, not knowing what was to come next and uh, adapting the curriculum to suit online learning. Like we try to be as engaging as possible and have lots of things that are tangible for the students to use in class and limit their screen time. And you know, then the next week they're on screen all day. Uh, and chasing students up. So a lot of our time, instead of being used for planning our lessons was being used to chase students up. Where's this work? Where's that work? Um, and and trying to get in contact with parents as well, which can be difficult with the language barriers. So overall, we realized we needed really clear expectations and communication for these students with a lot of different avenues for them to be able to understand what those expectations are. So this time, as we moved into uh, online learning, we've used uh, these behavior expectations, which are from Stanford in Hong Kong. Uh, all the students knew what the expectations were, all the teachers knew what the expectations were. We made it really clear. We're telling them verbally, we're sharing this with them. When we're in the uh, online meets, we have admin, we have year leaders popping in, checking. Don't forget, put your camera on, the expectation is this. So everybody in the school is reinforcing those expectations throughout online learning. And it's not different for every teacher, it's same online. 
So different teachers can have autonomy over the way they run their lessons, but the students' behaviour expectations are consistent throughout every class. Okay, so now that we were able to address the sort of behavior expectations, the next, the next hurdle was to think about, well, what were the expectations of what they had to do in class? So as Latoya mentioned, a lot of times students weren't necessarily clear about, well, what do I need to do? What's the task? Is there a different task for me from, than from the other students? How do I know what I need to do? And so we use uh, a, learning, a learning management system. Uh, our LMS is SECTA. But within SECTA, there's also a lot of flexibility for students to, for teachers to use um, Google Classroom or their Weebly websites or a personal blog. And so usually this is okay when we're face to face because, you know, the students are talking to the teacher and they know exactly and they can ask clarifying questions in person. However, when we went to online learning, the plethora of platforms that was being used became quite confusing for students. So um, our senior uh, leadership team rolled out this online learning uh, day planner. And so this came out of a need uh, that we recognized that students really needed to focus on their self-management and organization skills. So for those of you who, who are uh, at MYP schools, um, you'll know the ATL skills that really became a big focus, that is the approaches to learning. Um, and so these are given to us by the MYP Principles Into Practice book, and they basically give us specific skills that students need to be able to master throughout the content uh, and throughout their time in the MYP. And so the one that we focus on with online learning was managing time and tasks effectively, and specifically planning strategies uh, and taking action to achieve personal and academic goals. So all of this was achieved through uh, keeping a daily planner. And so all of the students were given this uh, template, uh, which we'll see in a little bit more detail in a moment. Yeah. And so they were given this online learning uh, day planner. And I'll give you guys just a second to take a look at that and see how it's divided. I think really the, uh, the key features of this planner is that they had, first of all, dedicated time to complete it before school every day. And so they would meet with their advisory in the morning. Um, ideally, they would have this completed before coming to advisory so their supervisor could check it and then answer any questions that they had or ask questions if they weren't sure about um, something that was on a student's planner. But if not, then at least the students definitely had that dedicated, dedicated time in advisory um, to complete the planner. So to get all their Google Meets uh, together in one area, to write a to-do list, maybe for homework that they had to complete that day or the next, and then any questions that they had that would pop up. So this was really just to consolidate everything into one place that students could refer to. And so they weren't having to check, uh, you know, Joe's Weebly website and this Google Classroom and that subject's uh, blog, you know, just having everything in that one spot. Um, something else, again, that we really appreciated about this uh, timetable, and you can't see it here, but um, what we saw before is that we did have that dedicated time before and after uh, the teacher office hours for students to have those check-ins um, and to consolidate their learning. So anything that they had questions about or that was on their to-do list, they could then write, okay, well, during that consolidation of learning time between three and four, when everyone's still online, when everyone's still available, I'm going to make sure that I, you know, ask my math teacher about this homework assignment that they said, but I'm not sure if it applies to me or if I have something different. And so uh, this was something that was really useful for students and then really useful for us as well as EAL teachers um, so that we could check with our students. So, so when we met up with them during that consolidation of learning time at the end of the day, we could check their planners and, and that would just make the whole process go much faster. So we could see, okay, well, what are you doing? Uh, what do you need to do? How can we you know, make sure that you're focusing your time well? Uh, and then the last thing we wanted to point out was, again, this commitment to well-being, uh, as I'm sure we all are aware of, uh, it's not great to spend all day online looking at the computer screen. Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit ironic to have a link to well-being resources and encourage you to get off the screen. But um, we did have these links down here um, that were just a whole range of activities that the kids could do, uh, you know, little Work, 10 minute workouts or a mindfulness video or a little bit of yoga. And so we did have that every single day as a constant reminder to the kids, come on, you know, like get out there, 
do other things. Don't just be focused um, on your schoolwork. Okay, um, so in addition to the planner, we also thought, well, how can we make sure uh, that students are actually doing this and how can we measure their progress on developing those ATL skills? So um, we came up with a rubric. So students had a rubric and this is the language acquisition ATL skill um, continuum, but every subject had them. And then because the whole school focused on organization, the organization skill became uh, one of the ATLs that every, every subject focused on. But then in addition to this, it would be more skills that were subject specific. Um, yeah, so basically with this rubric, uh, students would self-assess um, their skill development. And importantly, they had to have evidence of demonstrated learning behavior when they self-assess uh, their skill level. This allowed students to develop agency um, over their decision making and also kept them accountable for their engagement. So they developed a agency by making decisions about how to keep themselves organized, which areas to focus on um, and how they were gonna sort of manage their organization. And it also kept them accountable because they really had to learn how to articulate their organizational strategies when they provided that evidence of their learning behavior. So we'll take a look a little bit more detail at what that um, ATL rubric looks like. So at the beginning, at the top here, we had explanations of what the different sections meant. What is beginning, developing, developing, demonstrating, uh, and extending. And then here we had the ATL strand and within it questions that students could ask, well, the teachers would ask and students would ask it themselves. And then here are potential different answers. So within organization, we broke it down into three questions. How prepared am I for class? Do I meet the deadlines and take responsibility for my own learning? And then do I keep and use the planner? And then within that, so the teachers created these, um, but you could also have a teacher institute created. Um, students would select within each category where they felt they were. And then again, down here, they had, ooh, sorry, they had to justify uh, their rating and then provide evidence, maybe with the link, if we were doing online learning or just talking about it through a face-to-face -face of that learning behavior. Okay, um, that was a lot of talking on our end. Uh, we're just gonna give you kind of a minute to think about if you have any questions on the Daily Planner or ATL rubrics. Um, you can put those questions into the chat function and we'll address them, hopefully if we have time, uh, in you know, just talking about it, or if not, definitely we'll, we'll comment later. Let's just give you 30 seconds to kind of take a breather, think about any questions, and pop them in the chat box. All right, we'll do about five more seconds and then we'll move on. Okay, great. Okay, at any time you can add in your questions and then we'll get to them um, as we go. So now I'm going to talk to you about the role of a push-in teacher. So the way our EAL program works is we have dedicated and dedicated EAL English language acquisition classes. But then we also have a push-in teacher. The EAL teacher is the push-in teacher uh, for that grade level. So they have time to develop a strong rapport with those students and build that trust with the students. Uh, um, with students who are more vulnerable in a school where they don't understand the language yet. So the role of the subject teacher would be to create the content uh, for the learning objectives for the lesson. And then the role of the push-in teacher would be to modify those objectives. Um, create language objectives, simplify those objectives so uh, they're achievable for our EAL students. Um, the role of the subject teacher would be to teach the content um, based on the grade standards. And the role of the push-in teacher would be to find those keywords, to build vocabulary, to summarize the main ideas, um, to move from whole class to breakout rooms. And that can happen when we're on campus and we take a small group of students out to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, or it can happen online as well with Google Meet. 
and you send the students a different link and they can go to a different Google Meet session with you, the pushing teacher, and you can work one-on-one -on -one developing those skills, developing that vocabulary, asking them clarifying questions to see if they've understood the content. It can also be a time where they can use Google Translate. So sometimes they'll need to translate some of the information, the instructions and the words, particularly if they're in uh, phase three and below in the NYP. Um, we also, I can't see this. Uh, we also create assessments based on learning objectives. Uh, so uh, the subject teacher does that and then we modify that. So we work with that teacher to build up their confidence with modifying. We could start by modifying, showing them how to do it, modify their work maybe for the first term. Then after that, you really wanna be working as a team to modify together. Uh, and by the end of the year, you're hoping that while the teacher's creating their content work, they're thinking about those modifications. They're thinking about differentiation and they feel empowered to be able to tackle that themselves and then come back to you and say, what do you think of this? Do you think it's on the right track? Do you think it yields to the greater picture of learning? Here are some strategies for the push-in teacher during the online learning. Uh, we use the Google Hangout feature because we use Google Meet. So Google Hangouts like a chat, uh, which the students know from social media, so they're quite familiar with it. Um, we use that to speak to the students during the lesson. So while the content teacher is presenting the lesson, we use the Hangout feature. We might ask them some questions to see if they've understood, but also when they need help, when they don't understand, when they've missed the whole point of the lesson, they're more likely to ask you in the Google Hangout. They know you, they're comfortable, they know you're not going to, um, it's not going to be in front of the whole class. So their biggest fear is, you know, writing something in the whole class meet and looking like the student who, who can't express themselves clearly. So when it's just you and them in the Google Hangout, just the EAL class in the Google Hangout, uh, we find that they're a lot more comfortable asking for help. Uh, during the content teacher's lessons, we also use a Google Doc to take dot point notes. Uh, we clearly explain the expectations, but we really want to stick to like four or five dot points of the lesson. And, and then I put links on there as well. So maybe a link to a Quizlet, maybe a link to a video version of the article or something like that. So the students can have links to uh, more or less resources during the lesson. Um, during the lesson, I know any new vocabulary words for the students to learn. And sometimes when the students are on task and they're off doing their work, I can write that into a quizzes or a Quizlet or a Kahoot or a close activity or a crossword or whatever you want to use for the language learning. Um, and that's a really good use of your time and it really helps the teacher as well. So the content teacher might even use that Quizlet or quizzes for the whole class, not just the EAL students, because there's a lot of new subject specific vocabulary they need to learn. Another strategy for a push-in teacher is to engage in the lesson. So it's almost like you're there to support the teacher as much as you are there to support the students and the students feeling unmotivated need that boost of energy. So you can be that boost of energy in the classroom. You can ask those clarifying questions. If you ask, sometimes the rest of the students are really grateful because they were thinking it, but they just didn't have that uh, courage to speak up during the meet. Um, so yeah, a big thing is just get in there, boost your energy of the online room as well, and be that supportive team player with the content teacher. Building that relationship with the content teacher is so important because you need to negotiate with them. They're, they have that pride over their content. They've been teaching it that way for so long. So you need to find a way to negotiate these modified options for the students with language needs. And you don't want it to be like, oh, here's your modified work. You can uh, draw a picture of something. You want it to be similar to what they're learning, yield towards the learning as a scaffold, like a step towards what they're doing later on. Uh, another thing that a pushing teacher can do is host those breakout rooms when needed. So as I said, we have the push-in support and then we have the EAL lessons, but also because we push in, we get to see a lot of the lessons. So we get to see the way the science teachers run their lessons, the way the maths teachers run their lessons, all different subjects which we push into. 
Uh, and we found that supportive uh, language lesson structure for all students, not just for language students, is to have that book at the start of the lesson, something fun, really motivate the students at the beginning. When they join in the lesson, they're ready for uh, something interesting and engaging. So get their minds in the mode of uh, being excited about learning. Then focus on one main activity. So we all make the mistake of trying to fill in this online lesson with so many things. It's really hard for the students to concentrate on and they do need that individual time to be working. So um, when we have a lot of instruction uh, and a lot of activities, it can be really hard for them to produce quality work. So one of the things, as Juliet said before, we have to have a brief instruction time. So we try to aim for six minutes or less with the instructions and then get the students to start working. And that'll give us some time to work one-on-one -on -one with the students who need the most support. We also include extension activities and homework for the advanced students. So some of the, um, the best quality online lessons that I've seen has have links to that extra work. So if students finish something, there's always something else to go on with. Uh, and they're always being constantly challenged. So it's just making sure that your lesson is differentiated. Uh, we also found that exit slips work. Don't just let students leave the meeting and then work on their own. Make sure it's like, when you leave the meeting, you have shown me this. When you leave the meeting, you have shown me this complete. So that's the outcomes focused way that we run the online lessons. And then with the process focused, we uh, do that at the end of the week. So at the end of the week, we look at uh, what process you use in your learning, but at the end of the lesson, it's, you need to have a clear outcome and you need to achieve this before you leave the Google Meet. Um, and that works with advisory too, which is like a homeroom. Um, when Juliet was talking about the planner and the advisory teacher checking it, hi, welcome to advisory. Once I've checked your planner, once your plan is complete, then you can leave the meet. So the students who are really organized uh, usually get to leave the meet a little bit earlier and that's fine. So this is just a visualization of that supportive lesson structure. Five minutes or less for a hook, 10 minutes or less for instructional time, aim for six or less. Uh, make sure that you've got some dot points or you've written out those expectations on your um, platform as well, not just uh, saying it verbally because the students might not have picked up on it. Uh, then for around about 15 minutes, the students work individually or in small groups and the teacher can check in with those students and provide support for the students who need the support the most. Uh, and then those students who are already independent learners um, enjoy having that time to do their work independently anyway. Then we come back to the class, to so come back to the big Google Meet, less than five minutes, just a check-in. So as you've been checking on the small groups or the individual work, you might notice everyone's making a similar mistake or everyone has misunderstood part of the task. So you can come back to the meet, explain it, check in on them again, and then let them go. And you really need to let them go to have that time to complete the work. I think sometimes the content teachers like to um, uh, hurry up and move on to the next activity, hurry up and move on to the next activity. But the students do need that time to process it, to find everything online, uh, to think about the work, to read everything. They're a little slower at reading than you'd expect. To give them that time to actually complete the work online. And then the exit ticket to leave. If you've worked really hard that day, you might be able to leave early, that's great. If not, and you need the extra help, we're there to support you too. Okay, I think we are actually out of time. So we um, won't go through this. Um, we have a little bit more, but a lot of these are just sort of like uh, traditional language skill based uh, online resources. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this kind of stuff, British Council, uh, Brain Pop, a lot of this other stuff. We'll share um, the PowerPoint as a PDF with all of these links in there. So I think we're out of time. Hi everyone, uh, just to let you know, we have reached the, the end of the 30 minutes, but if Latoya and Juliet are happy to stay on the call for another few minutes and participants are all have some questions they'd like to ask, we're, uh, we're good to do that because we do have a break between now and the next session. Perfect, well in that case, I might just end with a really quick little thing uh, that we found an effective way of 
checking uh, whether students are doing these um, you know, these resources. Because I think a lot of times what we initially found is that we would sort of share these resources with students or practice station activities, but then it was hard to measure whether or not they were doing it, how well they were doing it, and if they were actually learning anything or continuing uh, with a specific language focus um, with, ooh, sorry, within those uh, online resources. So we created something that was called the ISL, the Independent Study Log, and this works really well with online learning. Um, so they record their independent learning activities or even assigned activities in the ISL, uh, which is periodically checked by the teachers. It's almost like, like uh, a homework collection dump where students put all of their work into this one PowerPoint, um, this one area where we can check on it and just make sure that they are uh, continuing throughout their learning and doing the things that we're asking them to do. So they initially take a diagnostic um, and then based on that, they create personalized language goals, of course, with our help. So they kind of fully understand what they need to work on. Uh, and then they choose from the menu, similar to the menu we showed you back here, sort of uh, their menu of the different skills. Um, they choose from that menu of skill-based activities, uh, which ones they're gonna do, and then record each learning activity as a separate ISL entry. So I'll just briefly go over what that looks like. Um, so I, I've done two versions for my higher level for my grade 10s. I've done uh, sort of a Google Doc, but that gets really messy because you end up having like 50 page Google Doc, which is far too long of students recording their activities. I find using a Google, like a PowerPoint, um, to be more effective. And so each entry is a different slide um, like this. And so we have the cover slide, then we have this for each one, each activity. Uh, they can link to the practice station, they screenshot what they've learned, uh, the results. So we do have that evidence and then they reflect on their learning. So they can say a short description of what they did, which language goal that helped to further develop, what areas they still need to improve on and then what they're gonna do next. And so we kind of walk them through this initially but then kind of let them go afterwards. And so this really allows them to do that independent, uh, personalized language learning uh, and record it in one place that is easy for us to get. Okay, Woo, marathon of talking there. Okay, any questions? Um, I guess we can check uh, over here or we can use that, the raising hand feature. If anyone has any questions, um, you can speak and, and ask them. Okay, oh, we have a question. Hi, um, I was wondering, as you've done this process, since we, I'm, in, I'm in Ho Chi Minh City as well, and I know that we've gone through two iterations of, of virtual schooling, um, what are some of the most notable changes you've seen in your EAL students as you've changed these systems and made them more um, sort of robust for EAL students? I would say one of the biggest changes, you know, as we went to online learning right before TEP break was uh, because we had a really clear system of like what home-based learning was going to look like. And we talked about that extensively at the beginning of the year when we were here in person. Students knew what the expectations were. They knew what it would look like. And we almost had, we, we did like practice sessions of online learning as well. And so we had already checked the cameras beforehand. Students knew the expectations. We talked about it. Um, so it wasn't, even though it was kind of a mad rush at the end, you know, like I think it was like a Monday afternoon. We learned that Tuesday the students weren't going to be in. But because we already had those systems and structures in place and those uh, very clear learning behaviors, and then also be able to support the learning behaviors uh, with um, clarification with the tools that we mentioned with the daily lesson planner and things like that, that, that those supports and the students being familiar with those supports already really allowed for a much smoother transition. Uh, and I have to say again, what I think really, really helps is having if anyone here is like able to control the structure uh, of the school day at all, highly recommend embedding consolidation of learning time uh, within the schedule, really giving students and teachers that time within the school day to have those meetings one on one that isn't necessarily within the lesson time, but outside of it. Uh, and so having that time available for students and teachers to meet um, and discuss and yeah, clarify questions. I think one of the biggest changes was we did find out in the afternoon and we had our class. So we still had like two periods until we moved to online learning the next day. So I had a package. So I had, here's your reading book. Here's this booklet. Here's your grammar booklet. So they could go home with something that wasn't all on the screen. So they had a little bit of time to work off the screen as well and uh, rest their eyes a little bit. So I thought um, having that tiny bit of time and being able to be prepared 
uh, with the students still in your class made a really big difference and with online learning. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Well, we might finish up and leave it there. Yeah, on. okay, great. great. Uh, well, Thank you so much, Juliet and Latoya. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat about sharing of resources. So Juliet and Latoya will post any resources on the Hoover app. So once we're done with the Zoom call, everything will switch back to Hoover again. So you can access the chat feature for this session or the Q&A. You can continue to ask questions, share contact details, keep in touch, and Latoya and Juliet will share any resources as a PDF with active links, because I know some of you have asked about sharing those resources that were presented today. What an awesome workshop. Before we go, could we please give a massive Zoom round of applause for our presenters today? <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia and Latoya. <laughs> um, hope you all have a fantastic day and enjoy the rest of the workshops at VTC. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.